So let's stand together. First Kings 21. This is about Naboth and Ahab, the king of Samaria, or Israel. And Jezebel. Don't you just like her? I just love that name. I think if I had another child, I'd name her that. No, I'm just kidding. I, you wouldn't do that. It's a terrible name. 1 Kings 21, 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is a spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? He spake unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite and the story goes on we'll get into that later how she wrote letters and had him stoned to death now verse 17 through 19 first Kings 21 17 and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying arise go down to meet Ahab king of Israel which is in Samaria, behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, Shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine? May God bless his word. You may be seated. Title of the message, Just One More Thing. As the subtitle says about chapters in life story or the stories of your life. Good stories are great, aren't they? I like a good story. Jesus told many stories. The Bible has full of great stories. But this is one of the strangest stories. It's the most powerful story, but one of the most terrible stories in the Bible. Many contrasts here. On one side you've got innocence and courage, integrity, fear of God. That's the vineyard farmer, Naboth. The other side's covetousness, cruelty, lies, death, and retribution or revenge. The wicked king Ahab and, king, and Queen Jezebel. The place of the story is Samaria. That's the capital of Israel. Jezreel is a king's summer palace. It's a hideaway resort, you may say, of something of that sort. Surrounded by all the pleasures and luxuries of royalty. Ahab thinks he's a big man. He should want for nothing. But not so then or even to this hour, 2016, just one more thing 
can send you under. Is that a picture of your life? I just have to have one more thing to make it. Or I want that one more thing. Every person is going to have a story in life. I don't know what story you're going to write in your life. I hope it's a good story. But like a story in a book, there have many chapters in a book. So let's look tonight at some of these chapters in a person's life. The first chapter is not a good one. It speaks of Ahab having a covetousness life or life of greed. 1 Kings 21, 1 through 4. Now, let's take a journey for a moment to the king's palace. Let's just get a picture. It's not listed in the scripture, but if he has everything that he wants and needs, let's take a picture. Perfect cut out stones for the steps to the entrance of the palace. Let's look closer at the doors. They are made of the wooden timbers from Lebanon. We call them the cedars of Lebanon. Servants bring goblets of wine and whatever drink they want, but they're not just plain cups, they are made of gold. Food in abundance. If you were there in those days, standing in that palace, you'd probably say, that's where my tax money goes. We make our way up to the balcony, see the beautiful landscape of trees, gardens, fields, as far as the eye can see. See, King Ahab burst out saying, look over there. There's that little vineyard. How beautiful it is. It's loaded with those delicious mouth-watering grapes. And I have even eaten a lot of them. Suddenly, he turns and he says, I am the king. I am the master of my kingdom. I have a palace. I have servants. I have silver and gold. I have horses and chariots. I have soldiers. But I want one more thing. A little vineyard. Belonging to a little man. Naboth is called to the king's palace. Let's make a trade, Naboth. I'll give you any vineyard on my property. Any uh, vineyard in Israel that you might like. Just I want yours because it's close to my property and the palace. I'll give you a fabulous price if you want me to pay for it. I have the gold and silver right here in the treasure bags. Naboth, calm, cool, and collected. He says three words. Not for sale. It's pretty simple, isn't it? There he goes, king stomping out in his temper tantrum. If you had a wife like Jezebel, I guess you could throw a temper tantrum. Acting like a big baby. Do you know what the last commandment of the Ten Commandments is? It's called the Tenth Commandment. Do you know what it is? Exodus 20, 17. Thou shalt not covet. C-O-V-E-T. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, wife, or the animal's possessions. In one sense, to covet is to envy. You desire what another person has, and you desire to strip away at it until you get it. Whatever it takes to possess it completely. It's not just walking by some say, oh, I'd, I'd like to have that. You know how we do that. But this coveting is just continuous until you want to step into the action and take it, even go out and take it. 
covetous person is self-centered. Ahab was so full of himself, he almost exploded. He's going to drive himself crazy. Besides having the devil wife Jezebel, he's going to drive himself crazy. Examine yourself tonight, myself. Ask the Holy Spirit, what is one more thing that I'm craving for? Is there? What do I so desire in my life that I'm going to try any method to get it? For a person, a plan, a possession, a thing? What is it? A covetous person is never satisfied. There's an old legend told about a giant who had a hundred eyes and a hundred hands. He said, I still don't have enough. Still don't have enough. But like mankind, the more he has, the more he wants, and the more he gets, the less satisfied he is. The first chapter of Ahab's life is called covetousness. Is that chapter in your life? My life? Let's pray with Brother Paul, the apostle, concerning a heart of contentment. Philippians 4, 11 and following, whatever state I am, to be content. He said, I know how to be a base that's low. I know how to be a, a bound that is have plenty. Paul hears the words of the Lord Jesus, Acts 20, 35. It's more blessed to give than to receive. You want to break covetousness? The coveting heart? Be a giver. Ask God for generous heart. Secondly, second chapter here, we may call it integrity. Now, this is a great chapter of one's life. We find this, verse 3, with brother Naboth. Integrity, trustworthiness, honesty, faithfulness. Does that describe your life? What was Naboth's reply to King Ahab concerning the sale or trade of the land? Let's paraphrase it. Dear king, I respect you highly, but the Lord forbids me to give up my father's inheritance. It started with my grandfather. It was my father's land. Now it was given to me. Said not to give it up. That's simple. To sell it or lease it out would be turning my back on the family and really to deny the one that I love and stand for. You have a heart of integrity? Honor God and your fellow man in word and deed? Are you honest, upright, straightforward? I don't know why I read this. I read it last week or two. I don't know if it's in Daily Bread or where I read it in a little devotion. This man said he walked through the cemetery and he saw this tombstone. It had the person's name, a man's name. And guess what the epitaph was? An honest man. I thought that's... How many people do you find that are really honest today? I hope you are. You want to try to be. Be faithful. Naboth wanted to reverence his earthly lineage, his family, but also the Heavenly Father. Integrity is where the principle means more than worldly honor. Naboth was not flattered by the interview with the king not deceived by the invitation to the royal palace. He wasn't influenced by money or gold or silver, the treasures that he was going to be given. What does it take to be a person of integrity? Like the story of the great football player Bubba Smith that he played years ago for Baltimore Colts. Some of you might remember that. He's doing uh, beer commercials. He didn't even drink. He didn't drink alcoholic beverage. But they got him to do it, and then he thought one day, he said, just what kind of person am I? I don't drink, and I don't want to promote it. I'm standing before every week thousands and millions of people, and here young people looking up to me in life, and here I am on a commercial. He dropped it. You know what commercials cost? 30-second clips, one-minute clips, I don't know exactly, but I can tell you one thing. You don't want to pay for it. He was a man of integrity. Sometimes you have to give up things. Do what's right. And honest. 
Are you going to follow Ahab or Naboth? Honest with your family or giving to the foolishness of man's deceit? Keep the principle of a clean conscience or compromise and give in to the devil's temptations? Are you going to stand upright in your decisions before God or will you cower down, succumb to your selfish, low-down ways? We need more Naboths, don't we? Faithful to God, faithful to the family, faithful to the church, faithful to the community, faithful to the work. See, something's got to happen on the inside if you're going to be a person of integrity. That's why we talk about the Proverbs, fearing the Lord, having wisdom from God. That's what it takes. Faith in the Lord Jesus, turn from the evil ways. All right, third chapter. Conspiracy. You like that word, don't you? Conspiracy. Or you call it plotting, scheming. In verse 5 that we read, we find out about somebody steps into the picture. She's just a fine woman, isn't she? She asks, Nab- I mean, uh, Ahab, why is his spirit so sad? He's not eating. He's moaning and groaning and pouting. She said, don't you know that you are the king of Israel? You can have anything you want. What if somebody told you that? You could have anything you want. Just say it. She says, quit your pouting. I'm going to get the vineyard. Well, the plot begins. She gets her secretary to write the letters in Ahab's name, sends it to all the elders and nobles, leaders. Isn't it interesting how the devil, at least Brother Paul in the Corinthians talks about the devil appears as an angel of light sometimes. Did you get that? Bright, beautiful, smart. Everything looks nice, sounds good. Watch, watch verse 9. This, this is a Christian, a godly thing right here. She wrote in the letter, proclaim a what? Does everybody see what verse 9 says? A fast is fasting and praying before God. She's using true God from the devil. Do people do that? Sure they do. As a disguise to accomplish an evil plan or purpose. So you call it a schemer, a conspirator, whatever you want. She's got it. She knows what she's doing. A God-centered time of prayer and humility, broken over sin. It's all a camouflage, cover-up. Look into history for a moment. Remember the name Hitler, don't you? In Germany. He told Christian leaders, said, don't bother about anything. I'm taking care of everything. Christian churches, nobody's going to bother them. Everything will be fine. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the faithful Christian who saw through his plots and schemes was put in prison and they killed him just a few days before the Americans and the Allies freed the prisoners. Terrorists. They're everywhere. But they have their religion. All kinds of people. They base it on religion. I have my God, you have your God. My God says, kill the infidels. Beware 
Awaken from the sleep. The devil and his Ahabs and Jezebels are scattered around the world. They're scheming. They're plotting against the true God and his son Jesus. More of evil, less of good. More of foolishness, less of wisdom. More of the devil and less of God. Fourth chapter. Fear and destruction. When one is afraid, he may do anything. Town elders and leaders knew the schemes and the lies and the plans of murder. They knew the sin against God was an outrage to Israel. But the fear of Jezebel, the idolatrous, the evil witch of Ahab gave in. They went along. They would not take a righteous stand. Let me ask you this. Do you fear God more than you fear man? It's a question. Watch the scene unfold. She gets two young men, sons of Belial, verse 13. And what do they do? There came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God. He's cursed God. Mocked God. And guess who else he mocked? He mocked old King Ahab. They carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones. And he died. Where was the trial? Where were other witnesses? You mean tell me in the night I walked out that door at the back, ten of you in the church met me and said, we have two witnesses against you, pastor. I said, two witnesses about what? We found out something about you. You going to believe just those two? You going to find out what, what they're even talking about? See, it's already set up. It's set up here. They're fearful of King Ahab and Jezebel. They know they will be killed if they did not do what they were told. So they lied. And they stoned him to death. Dragging innocent Naboth outside the gate. You ever been hit with a rock? I'm talking about a little rock. A little, just a little stone. hurt pretty bad you think about all kinds of biggest thumb biggest your fist biggest two fists and you're right down here and they're gathered around you and they fire at you bones breaking screams blood bursting from your head and you're dead In a matter of minutes, Naboth breathes his last and enters into eternity. And there they are, the lying witnesses, coward elders and leaders, religious nobles, fickle crowds. They're scattering. They're on their way out just to another day's business, uncaring, disrespectful. The hours pass and the sun is about to set. Darkness comes and it's the black of night. Naboth's corpse is laying at the rocks out in the open and the scavenger dogs come and lick up his blood. You get a glimpse of what fear the man can do, don't you? That's why you need more godly leaders in homes, churches, businesses, City, state, and national governments. You've got to have leaders with backbones stand for righteousness and truth. Don't play games with the devil. 
We have a victor. We have a conqueror. His name is Jesus. We are more, more, more than conquerors through whom? Him who loved us. That's Romans 8, 35 and following. You take it, check it out. More than conquerors. We can march forward at the spirit of power and of love and of sound mind, 2 Tim 1, 7. Fifth chapter, retribution. We can call it revenge. Evil queen is speaking now. Verse 15, she said, Dear Ahab, it's time to quit your pouting. Get to going. Go down and claim the vineyard. Go down to Jezreel there and claim that vineyard of Naboth. Heads out to the vineyard. And guess who shows up? A man of God. 17, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, verse 18, king of Israel. He's at the vineyard of Naboth. And you're to speak to him. Well, Ahab's conscience is burning now. I can tell you that. Have you found me, O mine enemy? Elijah said, I got your number, bud. That's Don's paraphrase. I got your number. And you know somebody else has got it? The Lord God's got your number. And he's cranked it up real high, too, on his list. The Lord said the same place that the blood was licked up by the dogs for Naboth, your blood's going to be licked up there, too. Elijah gives the details of the judgment for Ahab, Jezebel, and descendants. We see in verse 27, he seems to have some remorse. He rends his clothes. That means he rips them, puts on sackcloth, goes away mourning. He humbles himself before God, verse 29. But three years later, in spite of being warned by the prophet Micaiah, that's in chapter 22 now. You have to read this. We're not going to read it. He goes to battle against the Syrians. He's mortally wounded. He dies that evening. In 1 Kings 22, 34 and following, it says, As they washed the blood from the chariots, the dogs came and licked up his blood. That's what the prophet said. What happened to Jezebel? Well, she reigned a little while longer in Israel. You have to go to 2 Kings chapter 9. If you don't make a note there in your Bible... To look over that later. O Jehu is anointed king. And he sets out for Jezreel. What's his commission? To do away with the house of Ahab. And as he thunders into Jezreel in 2 Kings 9, 30 and following, he calls the terrified servants to throw Jezebel down from the top of the window. She's trying to pretty herself up, you know. I'm not saying she wasn't beautiful. I don't know. I've never read any things about or seen pictures about her. She probably may have been a beautiful lady. I don't know. But she sure was ugly on the inside. They threw her out. Splat. And then came Jehu. The wild man with his horse and chariot. And he ran over and over her. Elijah said the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the rampart. That's the wall of Jezreel. 1 Kings 21, 23 and following. What a tragic ending to a wasted life. Mark it down. There will be payday someday. Be sure your sin will find you out, Numbers 32 and 23. The judge of all the earth will do what is right, Genesis 18 and 25 and following. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, whatsoever he sows, 
that shall he also reap. Reap. Galatians 6 and 7. Coveting. Is that your chapter? Integrity. That's a great chapter. Conspiracy. Plotting evil. That's a downward chapter. Fear and destruction. It's good to fear God, but pitiful to fear man. Retribution and revenge. The Lord will get revenge. Let's bow our heads in humble prayer as we go into our invitation time. Father God, thank you for your word. A lot of great truths as we learn about the kings and situations of the past. And we pray tonight that we will know the true king, your king, the glorious son, Jesus Christ, the Lord, our Savior. If we have any of these bad sins in our lives tonight and we're not right with the true King Jesus, we better come humbly to Him by the way of the cross. He died and shed His precious blood that we could be forgiven. That's the most beautiful and wonderful blood because there's no other way to be saved, no other way to be forgiven. No other way to be reconciled to you, Father, get right with you, but through Jesus. Someone needs to come to Jesus by the way of the cross. And trust Him tonight, turning from their sins, knowing that not only he did, did He die, but He arose again and He lives forever and He wants us to live with Him. And then, Father, tonight we pray for those who need to come into your church be a part of the church family, the body of Christ. Then we as Christians, many love you here tonight, I know that. They trust you. They want to walk with you. Help us to see daily we need to stay close to Jesus and the Word of God. Let it come inside of us and change us from the inside out and make us your kind of people. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.